Well, good morning, everyone. How y'all doing? Man, it's good to be back here. If we've not met, my name is Steve Carter. And if you're watching online, welcome. If you're watching Windsor, welcome. We're here in Loveland, and we are excited to look back at the last year. How many of you um, watched the Clemson-Ohio State football game yesterday? Yeah, let's just pray for Pastor Carl right now. <laughs> Pastor Eric, Ohio State fans, they're having a tough day. Give them a just high-five, encourage them. Um, but those of us who love Michigan or any team that plays Notre Dame or Ohio State, we, we were happy yesterday. Um, but hey, how many of you had New Year's resolutions? 2019, you created a New Year's resolution. Some of you are like, that was so long ago, I forgot. <laughs> they say that of the 330 million people that call the U.S. home, that over 50% of Americans created a New Year's resolution in 2019. And... Only 25% of half of our country's population got to 30 days. And they are sub kind of suggesting that and kind of guesstimating that only 8% will actually complete their New Year's resolution. And I don't know about you, but I, I love the week between Christmas and New Year's. I love it because I like to look back at my journal. I like to look back at where I began the year, I, I like to think through my prayers, look at the areas where I grew, areas where I didn't grow so much, and I love to begin to think and begin to plan and prepare for the upcoming year. And as I was thinking about this, this is such a unique year because we get to the end of 2019 and we start a brand new decade, 2020. And I don't know about you, I, I'm excited. I'm excited for what God has in store. For foundations, what God has in store for me, what, what God has in store for our family. And, and this is what I want. I want us to begin just to kind of really thinking about, are there some places in our life, some places in our story, maybe in 2019, that we just stayed too long? We maybe overstayed. I don't know if you went on vacation, maybe you went to the beach, maybe you're near some water, maybe you didn't put on some kind of sunscreen, and maybe like me, you got a little bit of a sunburn. You overstayed outside. That's not actually my arm, somebody else's, but I, I, like, I, I don't know about you, it doesn't feel good when you get a sunburn for like a few days and then your skin starts peeling. I don't know if you are football fans, but maybe you saw this preseason Antonio Brown, who was with the Raiders, then he was the Patriots, then he's no longer, but he'll probably be with the Saints in the playoffs. But during the preseason, he went into this cryptotherapy kind of chamber, which basically pushes and pumps freezing cold air into your body to kind of heal your, your, your cells, supposedly. But he wasn't wearing the, the right shoes, and he stayed too long. And he got frostbite on his feet. You stay too long. Someone stopped me in the, in, the, in the lobby, and they're like, every time you're here, Steve, you bring bad weather. What's the deal? You know, and we're outside playing in the snow, and I'm like, man, we stay too long in this. We're going to look like those feet. No, thank you. Or maybe for some of you, it's the holidays. And you had some relatives come in from out of town. Some Cousin Eddie showed up, and they have stayed too long. And you're like, uh, it's okay, you're staying for another day, but if you want to leave, that's fine. That's fine. Or, or, or maybe, maybe you've been in a role, in a job, or maybe you've just stayed too long. <laughs> Any of you are Office Space fans. They just basically moved Milton down to the basement, stopped paying him but he got to keep his red stapler. Maybe for some of you, you're just in a role where maybe you've stayed too long. And, and I want to take us back to an old passage of Scripture. Maybe for many of you, you're not familiar with. It actually comes from Deuteronomy chapter 1. Deuteronomy is the fifth book of the Torah, the fifth book of the Bible. And most Jewish boys and girls, they had Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy memorized. Numbers memorized. That's commitment right there. And I'll tell you what, in Deuteronomy, it's just basically a collection of Moses' greatest hits, his greatest messages, his greatest sermons. And, and you've got to know that the Hebrew people, for 400 years, they spent time in Egypt. They were in slavery. 
And what did they do? They made bricks. And their worth and their identity was found in what they created with their hands. And if they didn't meet their quotas, they were beaten. And then the next day, with sore hands, had to keep making bricks. And God rescues them because God always hears the cries of the hurting and the humble and the oppressed. And he begins to lead them into the wilderness. And for 40 years, they spend time in the wilderness because, yes, they had left Egypt. But like many rabbis and teachers will say, sometimes it's harder for Egypt to leave us. And God wanted to teach his people that he was not like Pharaoh. He was a different kind of God. But something happened. They were really, really close from entering into the promised land. And they find themselves at a mountain. And this mountain's called Mount Horeb. And you got to know that there's probably 1.5 to 2 million Hebrew people. And the scriptures will tell us that for 13 months, they stayed put at this mountain. And finally, God just speaks to the people, and he says these words, the Lord our God said to us at Horeb, you have stayed long enough at this mountain. You have stayed too long at this mountain. And here's what I believe. I believe that the mountain is a metaphor for some area in your life today where maybe you have stayed too long. When we are going to be people who flourish in our faith, we are going to be people who are healthy emotionally, physically, mentally, and spiritually. And I think for all of us, we can look back in 2019 and say, hey, there are some significant steps I took for, for, made to become the person God designed and desires me to be. But there's also, for some of us, probably some places where we went backwards and where we've stayed put. In our struggle, in our brokenness, in our addiction, and maybe, just maybe, in this time when we gather together as a church family, maybe God's Spirit's going to whisper to you, that's your mountain. And I, I, I need you to recognize that you've stayed too long at this mountain. Question, can you name your mountain? In 2019, where did you stay too long? I like to refer, if you, if you don't know what your mountain is, let me just try and help you. I like to call this the overs. And maybe for some of you, you just overstayed. Maybe you overstayed in a toxic relationship. Maybe it was a dating relationship. Maybe it was a, a relationship um, where this person, this friend, actually wasn't really good to you. You just left not feeling really great about yourself. And maybe for you, you're like, man, this, I'm not growing closer to Jesus because of this friendship. Or maybe for some of you, you like overstayed in your role at work. Or maybe for some of you, you find yourself overworking. You just, you just can't seem to turn off work. And you'll be at home and you've got the cell phone out. And even though you're paid on salary for 40 to 45 hours, you're off the clock. And those little kids are looking to you, but deep down, all you're thinking about is work. And you're not getting paid for that. But like somehow there's something inside you that feels like I need to be needed. And maybe God's going to say, that's your mountain. Maybe for some of you it's overspending. You have just lived in financial chaos where you have spent more than you actually bring in. And you've extended the boundary stones and it just creates stress and anxiety. And the credit card companies, they're brilliant. They are brilliant at marketing. Do you know what the Chase credit card is called? The Freedom Card. <laughs> really? It does not bring you freedom. It brings you slavery. And literally, when you think about this, like you, you've got the average U.S. household is somewhere between twelve dollars and $15,000 in just credit card debt. And the interest alone on that. And maybe for some of us, this is the year where God's going to say, I want you to get your finances in order. Or maybe for some of us, you look at this, it's, it's we're overcommitted. We're just saying yes to everything. And good has become the enemy of great. What God is calling us to do, and maybe for some of you, God has put a vision in your heart 
of what he wants your life to do, but you have made all of these excuses to not actually fulfill that because you're just trying to keep everybody else happy and overextending and committing yourself. Or maybe for some of us, you're just over-distracted. You just can't stay present. Constantly, just squirrel, just turning, looking at something, and you're in a conversation, and your mind is a thousand other places. Maybe God's going to say, hey, this is the year where you become fully present. Or maybe for some of you, it's just overeating. And, and food is a relationship. Like you, For some of us, we just have an unhealthy relationship with food. And when we find ourselves in stress, or whenever we find ourselves feeling sad, or at some moment in our life hasn't gone the way that we wanted, we were taught or trained or made the decisions to run to food, and it be, has become a counterfeit. And maybe this is the year where God's going to say, I want to free you from that. I want to free you from that. Or maybe for some of us, it's just over-revved. We're just like, our RPMs are so high. We're so just can't bring it down. And we're just, everyone gets around us and they can feel our intensity. Or maybe for some of us, it's overreacting. You just say the first thing that comes into your head. When you get triggered, you just react. And it doesn't matter if it's your kid, it doesn't matter if it's a coworker, it doesn't matter if it's your spouse, it doesn't matter if it's a neighbor, it doesn't matter if it's someone who just cuts you off, you are going to speak your mind. And maybe God's going to say, you've stayed long enough at this mountain. Or maybe for some of us, it's just overwhelmed. 2019, for some of us, we felt the pressure on just going, there's not enough time to accomplish and keep everything going. And maybe God's going to say, can I tell you that maybe 2020 is a year of peace and shalom? I also think that there's something called what I like to refer to as the leftovers. Now, you got a whole bunch of overs, but I also think that there's a little bit of leftovers. And what I mean by that is sometimes, and never before has this ever happened, but with internet, with social media, with radio, I mean, we can basically get a message anytime, anywhere. And what oftentimes, even when you're on Instagram or Facebook, you can see a 30-second clip from a church, a 90-second clip from a church. You can have downloadable information, which is an absolute gift. But here's the problem. Some of us are living off the leftovers of somebody else's faith and study. And we haven't touched this book for months. And maybe God's going to say, hey, hey, no shame, no shade, but maybe, maybe this is the season 2020 where you find yourself back in this book with me. Or maybe for some of us, when we think about leftovers, I also think that God has blessed us with resources, with gifts, and sometimes, sometimes even with, well, let me just Quick time out. How many of you like wings? Any of you like wings? Yeah, well done, 10 o'clock. Um, here, here, here's the thing. I, I think that there are two types of people who eat wings. There are the kinds of people who make an absolute mess, and they don't even care about what's on their face, but they clean the bone, right? And then there are the other people who, like, don't really want to touch the wing, and they kind of pick the food and the meat off of it, and they leave a lot on the bone, right? And, and here's the thing. No, no, no shame on this. But sometimes, then they take that, and they either just kind of like throw it away, and it just literally becomes scraps, right? I've just been thinking about this. Sometimes even with our gifts, and sometimes even with our resources, in what we give back to the church or what we give back with our tithes, sometimes we're not giving God our very best or the first fruits. We're giving God the scraps, the leftovers. And, and, and for some of us, maybe God's just going to say, hey, hey, you've stayed too long at this mountain. And this, this is where I want us to wrestle with today. Using God's word, I want us to begin to identify the mountain where we've stayed too long, can you name it? Where have you stayed too long in 2019? Where have you stayed too long? But what's so beautiful about the scriptures is it doesn't just identify a problem, 
It shows us a path forward. Look what the verse says. You stayed long enough at this mountain, and then look at the next word from Deuteronomy 1, 6, and 7. Turn. Turn. I mean, I think this is incredible. Because you've got all of these people, they're here at Mount Horeb, and they've become so familiar with this mountain. I mean, they know where to get water. They know where to get food. They know where to go when there's some sense of conflict that needs mediation. They have created the infrastructure in 13 months for 2 million people to survive. But God says, hey, hey, here's what I want you to do. I want you to turn. And what he's doing is he's lifting their eyes from the familiar to see where he wants to call them. And what's incredible is this, that Deuteronomy will show us that from the time that the Hebrew people actually leave this mountain and begin the journey towards the promised land, it takes them only 70 days. But that's not even actually true. Because on day 40, Moses dies. And when Moses dies, they have 30 days of grieving, or in Hebrew, they call sitting Shiva. So really, really, the Hebrew people are only 40 days away from the promised land. And they can walk it in their air Birkenstocks. And, he, and here's what God's doing. He's literally saying, I want you to turn and see a vision of where I want to take you. A vision of where I am wanting to bring you. And here's the truth. Many people can name their mountain, but many people struggle with having a vision for where God wants to take them. And when God says turn, he's trying to get a mind shift, perspective shift. And I love this because the word turn, when you begin to look at it in the original language, you begin, it, it, just, it brings up one of my favorite words. It's the word teshuva. And teshuva is a beautiful word. It's the word repent. Now, I know for some of us, maybe we've had bad experiences because we've heard someone scream it at us like I did when I went to Mile High Stadium a few months ago. And, and I thought to myself, that's not what that word is all about. Teshuva is the sense of turning and having a better vision for your life. Not more fear, not more shame. It's being lifted to see what God wants to do in and through you. Teshuva is the most invitational word on the planet. It is this gigantic welcome mat where God's saying, welcome home. It is this complete 180 to return back to the mission and the vision that God intended and destined and desires for you. This is what God is trying to do. Now, here's the truth, though. Many of us struggle with having a vision because there's other stories that play on repeat in our life. Dan Allender, he um, is kind of president um, of, the, of the Seattle School. It's a, a, a counseling school, and he's a great Christian thought leader. And he talks about the linear life pa pattern most people believe is that it's, it's past, present, future. But he says that's actually not how it works. Most people live their life in past, future, present. And this is what he means is that for every one of us in this room, we've had experiences with trauma, with some sense of addiction or struggle. We've been abandoned or neglected or betrayed or hurt. We struggle with trust issues, right? And we've had these experiences in our story. But often what we do is we create those stories and predict that those stories are going to happen in the future, which gives us an out so that when we literally walk into the present, we're like, I'm going to be abandoned again. It's going to happen again. And we go in total survival mode. And this is what God is wanting the Hebrew people to understand. I know you were once slaves. I know this is what you think your identity is. But I'm telling you, the vision that I have for you is my promised land. Is something so much more. And I believe God has that for every one of us. The problem is we just tell old stories and listen to old tapes more than sitting with the vision and the mission that God has destined for us and for you specifically. 
Because, as I like to say, we're really, really good at remembering the things we ought to forget and forgetting the things we ought to remember. See, I, I can remember all of the stuff I did in the past. I can remember all of the pain points, and then I can create a story that literally predicts what my future will be, and then I live into that story instead of forgetting that stuff and remembering God put me on this planet for a reason. And what God began, he wants to finish. And that's not just with me, that's also with you. Look what the verse says, though. You've stayed long enough at this mountain. Turn, get that vision, and then set your journey. Set your journey. Now, here's the thing. You're never going to leave your mountain if you don't get really irritated with the mountain. And you're never going to leave that mountain if you don't just get irritated, but you don't have a better, more compelling vision. And I'll tell you what, you're not going to leave that mountain if you're not just frustrated and irritated with that mountain, have a compelling vision, and have done the work to set your journey. Nobody coasts into greater depths with Jesus. I've never met anybody who was like, I just drifted into being an amazing disciple of Jesus. Not sure how it happened. I just seemed to coast into getting my finances in order. Didn't make a budget. I just drifted into it. I've never met anybody who was like, you know what? I started the year 40 pounds overweight. I didn't have a plan. I just drifted in and now I'm the healthiest I've ever been. They have all Name their mountain. They have all had a vision, and they have all done the work to set the journey. Now, I know. I know some of you are sitting here. You might be in your 20s. You might be in your 30s. You might be in your 40s. Someone stopped me in their 50s and 60s after the, the previous service and told me, hey, I struggle. I struggle because I don't know how to do this. I wasn't given a map. How do I set a journey. And here's what I want to share with you. To set your journey, number one, is you've got to set the plan. Set the plan. If you literally want to get up earlier to read your Bible, then ask yourself, what time am I going to wake up? What am I going to read? Where am I going to sit? Like, you just begin to interrogate the plan. If you want to like start working out, you set the plan. Who's going to be your trainer? You want to start getting your finances in order. You set the plan. Number two, most people struggle with this. You got to share the plan. Do not keep this with you. Christianity was never meant to be a solo sport. This is about us. And when you share your plan, it really invites other people into your life. It invites other people to pray for you. When they check in, they can ask you about the plan. They can speak into your plan. Like, maybe I would think about doing it just a little bit different. But when you have this kind of community, it makes it easier for you to get from here to there. Number three, you got to name the pain points. Every one of us, every one of us is going to experience resistance to encounter the promise that God has for us. Just because we have a vision and because we've set a plan doesn't mean that, oh, it's just going to be easy. No. Life happens. Enemy is real. We get tempted. And all of our previous years on this planet have told us, stay put at the mountain. It's safer. But the more you step out in trust and dependence on God, man, you got to have the awareness to identify what are those pain points. Maybe for some of you, you're like, I don't want to wake up so early in the morning. I like my sleep. Well, that's going to be a pain point. Or maybe when I have stressful days and I find myself going to the refrigerator, maybe I shouldn't have Trader Joe's peppermint jojos 
that I have been freezing. Maybe I should take all the Thin Mints that I purchased in 2019 and throw them away, which I have done. But like literally, if you're, you got a name, where will you return to the mountain? And then number four, most people don't do this. You got to share the pain points. Share the pain points with the people going, hey, here's, the, here's my potential obstacle to return back to my mountain. Stress, worry, time. I just, this is what I typically do. So please ask me about this. Fifth, 40 days. I said it already. And, and why 40 days is so important is because that's how far the Hebrew people were from the promised land. But more than just that, 2020 is a leap year, so we're going to have 366 days. And sometimes when we make New Year's resolutions, we create these ethereal plans. Like someday I'm going to be this. Someday, without the plan. And, and I remember when I was a kid, my dream was to play Division I basketball. That was my dream. And I had, I had my reasons for it. But I remember in fifth grade, my parents dropped me off at Pepperdine University to a, a full week basketball camp. It was the only time that I was away from my family, it was the, or it was the first time I was away from my family for a week. And I was in the gym every day, just playing. And at the end of the week, they handed me this two page evaluation of my skills as a fifth grade basketball player. And I read it and I almost broke down crying because they told me that my left hand dribbling was below average. And my bounce passes, thumbs down like you're milking a cow, my bounce passes were below average. My jump shot, they didn't even have a grade for it. It was so bad. It was like a G minus minus. <laughs> and I remember looking at this going, there's no way. I showed it to my dad. My dad was so amazing. My dad just gets down on his knee and he goes, yeah, if you read this, you'll create a story that you can never fulfill. But what if we broke it down section by section by section? And let's say for the first month, all we're going to do is we're going to work on your left hand. And I take you to the grocery store. I'm going to give you a racquetball. And I want you to follow me. And I want you to dribble that ball. And I want you to work on that left hand. And in the next month, we're going to work on our passes, and we're going to watch videos by Pistol Pete, and we're going to go to the park, and we're going to pass, and we're going to pass, and we're going to master that, and then you know what we're going to do? We're going to spend the next 13 years on your jump shot because it is broke, <laughs> but what he was doing, though, so brilliantly was he was breaking things down so that they could become more manageable. They were more bite-sizable. I don't even know if that's a word, but I just say it. But it's like it became something that you could actually accomplish rather than some ethereal idea. And at the end of the 40 days, calibrate. And so, so sometimes what I do I have an old like paper calendar, but I look, look and I break it down by 40 days. And on that 40 day, I say, hey, I'm going to calibrate back. How have I done? And I'm going to go, man, was I too lofty with my goal at this 40 day marker? I got I to gotta adjust and maybe make some switches and some changes so that I can prepare to keep growing in the next 40 days. And when I get to the end of those 40 days, and most Christians, we're not very good at this, and it surprises me. I, I say celebrate. Celebrate that you're actually taking in ink and you visualize where God wants to take you and you set the plan, share the plan, you identify those pain points, you share those pain points, you name it in 40 days, God, here's where I want to go. And when you begin to live like that, whoo, 
you begin to get to the end of a calendar year or the end of a 40-day plan, and you begin to go, man, I took some steps of growth. And it becomes the snowball effect of momentum to say, I want to grow more. I want to grow more. God, work in me more. Heal me more. Make me stronger here more. And this is how we grow. Nobody just drifts one day and goes, you know what? I just somehow woke up and I was like Billy Graham. <laughs> it's crazy. I could preach like him, evangelize like him. It just happened. And you've heard me say this and I will say it. You just can't microwave spiritual formation. It takes time. So be kind to yourself and go with Jesus on this journey because as you watch him, as you walk with him, as you follow him, and as you actually name those desires in your heart and bring them before him and make that plan, whoo, you are going to become more and more like the person he intends you to be. I love how this passage ends, though. It just says this, you have stayed long enough at this mountain. Turn, see the vision, and set your journey. And then look what it just says, and go. Go and go. It's like God's just saying, hey, hey, you know you've stayed too long here. You know I have called you to my promised land. You know that. You have all of the power to set the plan. Now, go. Now, here's the thing. And let's just real talk. I love Foundations Church because you all are people who don't just come to church. You love to be challenged by God's word. I respect that. But I'll tell you what. There's a number of people who never name their mountain. If you can name your mountain, good on you. There's a number of people who don't ever do the work to have a vision, just to pray and say, God, help me. And there's a number of people who never take the courage to put it in ink and then there's some amazing people who have some incredible plans for where God wants to take them, but they lack the courage to absolutely take the first step and go. And you know what I wish? I wish I could teleport myself and be in multiple places. I wish, I, I wish you could come up to me and say, Steve, can you just show up at my house at 5.45 a.m.? And just like wake me up and we could do like Bible study together. I'd be like, yeah, that'd be awesome. I'll ring your doorbell. I'll walk into your house. It'll be weird and creepy, but it will be awesome, right? <laughs> I wish I could be the person who said, you want to go to the gym? Let's go to the gym. I wish I could be that person. I can't. It's just not physically possible. But I'll tell you, God's spirit is with you. Never leave you nor forsake you. So the Bible teaches us. But I'll tell you this. I can only tell you what the Bible says. And here's the, here's the challenge. It's up to you now. You have to get to a point where you get so frustrated with the, your mountain and you go, no more. I don't want my marriage to be like that anymore. I don't want my finances to be like that anymore. I don't want my life to be like that anymore. I don't want that anymore. And to begin to take the steps, as a friend of mine, Andy Minio, says, you either make moves or you make excuses. And the truth is, you're either making moves towards the person God intended you to be every single day, or you're making excuses in returning back to the mountain. And it's up to you. It's literally up to you. And I'll tell you what, all of heaven saying, you can do this. You just gotta name your mountain. You just got to be able to turn and have that vision that God's for you. God's with you. You're his son. You're his daughter. He's gifted you. And he wants you to set that plan, and he wants you to go. And I have to motivate myself because I'm not just someone who's like, let's go. Especially when it's really, really personal and vulnerable to the desires of my heart. I get a little, little nervous. I get really fired up for other people's visions. I get really, really nervous for my own. And so if you walked into my office you'll see this quote that I just put up on the wall because when I think about that word go, I define go as this quote from Jim Harbaugh that literally is attack each day with an enthusiasm unknown to mankind. And when I go, I don't want to just go like, I want to like go. 
I want, I want to go and set an example for my son and my daughter. I want to go because I believe that God is with me. God has gone before me. I want to go because I never want to just get to the end of my life and go, you know what, man? I spent so much time at that mountain. It was awesome. And I never grew. I just stayed put. And I think the danger of Western Christianity is we have been okay with the plateau. And I think God is just literally saying, I want dependent and expectant people. People who are humble that can name, I'm not perfect, I've got mountains. People who have profound levels of trust to step out and begin to risk themselves for what God has for them. What's your mountain? Where have you stayed too long? And as you look ahead to 2020, what if you could see a vision of God using you, God working in you, in your marriage, in the marketplace, in this church, to do something so extraordinary and only of Him that not only just blesses you, but man, blesses those around you. Can you imagine getting to the end of 2020 and just sitting here going, I was actually part of the 8% who followed through. I was actually part of the 8%. And you can look back and you'd be able to look in your journal and you could go, I left that mountain. And sure, there's going to be other mountains to hike and climb and leave. But man, you can say, I left that to trust God. And look at the relational blessings. Look at the blessings that God bestowed upon me. But again, that's up to you. Your choice. God's saying to all of us, you stayed long enough, turn, set your journey, and let's be the people who go. God, I'm so thankful for this church. I know every one of us in this room knows that we haven't arrived. We don't want to just be people who get up and go after our own desires, but we need to hear from you. I love just the song that we sang earlier today. We're not going to move without you. We won't move without you, God. We need to hear a vision from you. But God, I pray that every one of my brothers and sisters, my friends in this room, people who call Foundations Church home, God, that when you whisper, when you proclaim, when you give us a vision to lift our eyes and see where you want to take us, I pray we'd have the guts, the grit, the trust, the courage to set the plan and go. Not just for ourselves, but for all of northern Colorado. We love you, God, and all God's people said, amen.